Um, and I'm going to open up for a, 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 if anybody has a quick answer about why you copy reality. I mean, I'd love to hear it. Um, if anybody, anyone have a, a, a quick thought on why you co we copy reality? I think may, may, well, my guess would be that it's uh, because it keep, makes people feel safe. It gives them something that they're familiar with. So it means they can, uh -huh. makes it easy to engage. I think that's that's a reason, but you know, you but that's also different from where you know being the goal. And it gets it gets tricky because what I do in my own work, I mean, I here are the classes I teach, and you know what I said earlier about art installations. Uh, what's the difference between an art installation and an educational installation? Not necessarily much. And so all those lessons I learned from poetry um, apply to how I take my educational work, um, how I steer it, how I move it around. <laughs> yeah, please don't click the slides. Thank you. Um, so that's this is where I'm, I'm beginning and where I'm starting. Uh, this sort of notions of poetry and this question about reality and how reality kind of gets in our way. So I'm going to do a quick exercise, an icebreaker, because uh, I'm going to dive into the mechanics of breaking from reality in a minute. But there is a trick that I occasionally do with uh, my groups, which is an icebreaker which is, it's called Best Day Ever. And uh, Nick, you're right in front. Nick, uh, can you tell me a favorite food of yours? A favorite food? I think it's bananas. <laughs> Banana, oh, that's a nice choice. Okay. Uh, so, now Frame has this really amazing ability where I can actually then take, you know, your suggestions and bring them in live, which to me, I think is kind of nice. It's a little bit awkward to manipulate these things just because the tools that we're using were designed for building, not for social interaction. In other words, the reality of our developers frame are pushing for more construction and less you know, social use, which is kind of a hassle. But you know, they have limits. They have to you know, find their focus. All right. Next up. Um, Nick, do you have a favorite um, band or type of music? The Beatles. Uh-oh. <laughs> what? The Beatles. What kind of music? The Beatles. Oh, the Beatles. Oh, okay. I, for some reason, I did not expect such a classic. Although it does, curiously, you're the first person that I'm going to have some trouble with, with this coming example here. So, well, you'll find out. Last question. Do you have a favorite location? I mean, if you could travel anywhere in the world, where would you go? Burgundy in France. Burgundy. As in coast of France, Burgundy? Yeah, right. Let's see. Let me search. Now, does anybody else do something like this in their frame spaces? where they ask their audience questions. Not yet. I'm really uh, enjoying the fact that you're doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. Yeah. I mean, so here we go. I mean, you can do something kind of unique and special here. Now, mm -hmm. does anybody remember what I called this exercise? Best day ever. OK, so. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Nick, <laughs> if, if you had, I mean, wouldn't this be the best day ever if you could be in Burgundy with a big bag of bananas and sing a Beatles cover band? Yeah, that would be fantastic. 
Have you ever thought about that before? No, no, never actually. I'm good. No, <laughs> but see, here are your favorite things, and you've never thought about them. Why? Well, somehow I didn't combine these three. Ah. Well, I, 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 I would go as far as to say it wouldn't be realistic. That reality teaches us to divide up and not go for things that are out of reach. I mean, we don't necessarily put our favorite things together in ways we should. And that's, I think, my first lesson to everyone here is that think about what you want. What, what, what are the favorite things that you want to do in a VR world? What are your actual goals? What do you want to accomplish? And work from there. Because if you just start trying to be realistic, you're never going to have the, your best day ever. Also, Paul, do you know how to turn off your um, pointer? I'm just going to recommend it. There's a pink thing. All no, right. I don't. So I don't then. No, if anyone can tell me. <laughs> Nick, Nick. Um, no? I pressed something that, on my keyboard and it came on. Ah. Uh, yeah, I know it's a hot key, but I've forgotten which one. Ah, uh, is it P? It's probably well. Let's. I, I'll try it. Hang on, I'll try P. Let's see, let's see what happens. It's oh, thank you. oh perfect! Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Little laser blast go out. Okay, great. So this is where we're starting, but it's not. This is just the beginning. What I want to do now is talk about scenes. And has anybody used the scene feature before? Yes. Yeah. You've done a couple of things. I'm going to assume though that you did stuff like this where you went to the scene and you brought in an object for your stage. Mm -hmm. So basically scenes allow you to replace well everything in your world with new stuff. But it won't replace in frame the initial uh static mesh. And this is cool, but it's kind of a problem because you can't really see or interact with this globe. It's kind of small. And if the if if we had like 50 people here, the max, um, you'd all be kind of crowded around it. And this is where the architecture of reality begins to fail us. Because we're in a 3D space and nobody wants to see a 2D slideshow. I mean, there's an expression to see 3D and yet we're already kind of limited. So we've got this space. We could make it bigger. And I want to point out that Nick's space doesn't have a ceiling, a roof. But it does have some little architectural elements. Um, around it. And I want to ask uh, Nick about his design process. A little, you know, if you have a short version of why you took off the roof and why you have these uh, white arc, um, arches in the space. Well, I wanted to use uh, 360 pictures of skies here so it's better to see and it gives a nice atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And um, well, the arches, well, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I just like them. Well, you know, I teach game design, I teach design. So for me, I, I get that you wanted, I mean, you knew there wasn't gonna be any rain in the space. Hmm. It's always a sunny day. And it, so you wanted you wanted open and you wanted, um, you know, that sense of the outdoors, but also in an indoor space. And then the, the arches and stuff, I mean, that's your way of, of segueing your transition because it's, it's very a stark contrast going from, you know, bricks into the sky. But those arches kind of, you know, help us visually go from one point to the next. So I'm going to say that you were embracing your inner poet. This structure has poetry in it. So presenting in 3D, so exploring poetry, great. What else do we do? We do 2D. We also do tours, right? 
So basically, I, I take it everyone here has been on a tour and follow me around, if you would, please. Well, we do a tour, yeah. we walk, and this is, you know, if we're going to see a 3D object, we normally see a series of 3D objects and stop at any given point and talk. I'm not going to bother stopping per se, but, you know, it's an interesting question about if we want to see something in 3D, we have to position ourselves around everything over again. Um, then walking is kind of slow, getting set up is kind of slow. It's the two main choices that we do in these VR worlds kind of suck. I mean, tours aren't bad, 2D isn't bad, but it's not everything that we really need. So if you turn around, I'm going to use the frame uh, scenes feature again and say, oh, we're out in the field. This is another magical place that people come. And a lot of people like teaching in this open space, which is great. Um, in fact, we can use the scenes feature and bring in what might be the start of an exercise. Um, I know Nick works with people in Europe and languages. So we can put it down a map. And Nick, you can have your students, they can go to the places that they're born in or from. Or how about this? In our best day ever, you know, you wanted to go to Burgundy. So how about we say, everybody go to the country they most want to visit. And then you do an exercise, say, use Google image search and find an image or two that represents why you want to visit it. So we have this map and all these little mini in miniature installations, which would be nice. And then even flip that up further and then have the people from those countries go stand on those countries and explain those images. So somebody who wants to visit a country puts down something stereotypical or something they like, some reason why they want to visit the country and then have the actual people who live in the country, th those people as individuals or groups try to explain it. That makes for a nice class icebreaker, wouldn't it? And again, you can't do that, sit it in a little, sit in the little stadium. You can't do that looking at a 2D image, but you can do it here. And, you know, if we, you know, we build something, we move on, we can just clean up like that. I mean, the scenes feature allows you to do a series of installations. So we could go on to the next one. And I brought the world back. And the world still does not fit on the grass. I mean, granted, if anyone is part of the global south and wants representation, this is great. There is a unique VR bias, I suppose, for the Global South. But it raises a real question about how do we share big objects or can we share big objects with an audience? Does anybody here have a guess about where I can put this globe to share it with everybody in a more reasonable fashion? Nick, Toby, anybody? As a, as a globe, uh, as a sphere, I suppose. Yeah, where can I put it in this space right now where everyone can kind of see it better? Well, as a skybox, perhaps. Well, how about this? How about this? Ooh. Everybody has these ledges and cliffs in these worlds. And yet now, if you walk up to the edge, walk up to the fence, you now have a full-size globe that you can see. <laughs> and maybe interact with. Cool. Now you notice that I'm standing behind the fence for a reason, though, because and I I am going to suggest you get back here, although you don't have to. <laughs> because once we have a big model in place, um, we're going to explore making it interactive. And don't you want to put a big interactive model in front of a large group of people? So, here's another globe. Try clicking it. Try clicking it and exploring it. And use the emote if you if you if you when you're doing stuff if you think it's fun or interesting.
Now, guess is what? It? These behaviors are all local. All right? Local behaviors. Nobody else sees what you're doing. I haven't clicked the globe, so all I see is the globe. Uh, Kirk, can you tell me what you're seeing? Yeah, I'm seeing the uh, the fox on top of the world, uh, mm -hmm. animated, and I can hit buttons next to it, sit it, make it sit, say yes, no, make it spin, flip, fall. Yep. And nobody is seeing the fox flip when you click. You get to explore all of this on your own terms, and I get to ask you questions about what you're seeing. Like, do you think this sort of approach is a good idea? for teaching or this ability should be better utilized <laughs> i was hoping for a quick yes yes, yes. oh yeah you're asking me okay yeah. <laughs> yes yeah interesting interesting yes it's very engaging so, I mean, isn't think it think about yeah make things learn and but... all you and all it takes is the right space and stage in fact, mm. technically, you're standing on a balcony that also happens to double as space. So, you know, why are we trapped in that little tiny room in that building to feel safe when we've got all these abilities to explore out here like this? And, you know, when you're in the 3D space and you're looking at that 2D slide and you've got to click on it to zoom, that sucks. You can't zoom out. You can't, you, I mean, it just feels weird to me to have an image glued to my forehead. And you know, the normal spaces that everyone uses, you can't go in and explore. But if I want to share a 2D image, this is a graph from Toby. And I can share it. And in fact, if you turn your avatar, you'll notice that it turns with you. It's got a billboard node. So no matter where you stand, it's going to face you as well. So, you know, we can use these spaces. We can use these ledges to teach. We don't need to be limited. I mean, we've got the ability to put a big full screen image in front of everybody instead of having to, you know, click or squint. It's, it's kind of odd and sad, I think. So let's take this even further. So we've got this image. What if this image was our world around us? Um, boom. Wow. Let's go inside that. Whoops. I've got the whole. <laughs> That's brilliant, Steve. My bad. Let's go inside the ring and have a talk. I'm going to go to the video edge. I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. Or not stand where you are, but. I'm going to go to the, this and stand on my little dot. And, you know, That's we can have a conversation inside the data. Wow. Uh, you guys can come forward. Actually, come, come, yeah, you know, come a little bit forward. But, and guess what? If I want to like talk about something else, I can rotate this and talk about the next subject. When I was talking about immersive diagrammatics, I wasn't kidding. Absolutely brilliant. Diagrams can, you know, be useful. Uh, you're okay, Paul. But see, Paul is doing, and all of you have this sort of same sort of question. Where do I stand? Where do I go in this sort of unique universe? And that question that Paul and others have is 100% on target. And we will loop back to that in closing. But again, I just want to say that we can put data in spaces and you can use scenes to access it, create your talking points. And in fact, if I had something more to say, I mean, what's what's underneath it? What's underneath this data? I mean, lift it up and maybe have something hidden underneath. It's partly a gimmick, but it's also partly context to create conversations. Um, now, I will say that uh, I don't know why it clicked all the way back there. My apologies. But I'll go on to the next scene and say it creates context. Like for Toby, he wanted to use this to talk about accessing people. 
So our positions are a little bit off, but all of these types of tools were used to inter interact with other people. In Toby's world, these are countries, these are nations, these are tribes and clients, and they all inter interact and have relationships. But you, you have to kind of write and understand the cultures within all of these nowadays to reach out and get your global goals. Um, and Toby, you are welcome to borrow as much of this as you want. Uh, Nick, you are welcome to borrow as much of this as you want. And I will put this out that if you need help or want minor tweaks to anything, I'm also available to help. And I'll put this on the table for anyone else. If you want to explore this style of conversation, this style of work, um, you're more than welcome to. In fact, that's kind of my next slide. Because I started thinking about how do I build a class space that supports this? And I built, well, this, which is, you'll notice that you're a kink. This is the scaled up version. <laughs> Normally frame does, I mean, my frame spaces are for like eight people. So this normally is for eight people, but I scaled it up to be 50. But you'll kind of get the same concept, right? That there is a stage, a big one, and then there is a, or actually a couple of layers of stage. And then there is a grass plate and there's a deck. But here's the kicker. This space, these walls, these are all in pieces. This is a modular class environment. So I will hit edit mode and say that, um, you know, we can move or delete these pieces. So you can create whatever kind of classroom you might want. That includes even ditching this stage. or making it into a building. Again, a modular structure for building a present, a, a modular framework for building immersive presentations is what you're seeing. And what I mostly use is this space, is this closing one. Uh, this is my flight deck. Where, this one piece here, whoops. Oh, I am <laughs> I am out of position. Uh, apologies. But if you'll notice that what I tried to do here, if you walk back to the deck, that whole like, how do you interact and do things in this space? We've got the option to, you know, have a have a grass land strip if we want to. But if we want to share the 3D models that are big, we can get rid of it. And I'm showing the pieces of my classroom right here, which all of this is about poetry, or loops back to that early poetic work, breaking apart and exploring reality. Thinking about what we want to accomplish, what goals we have, uh, what makes us happy, but it, what would be our best day ever in VR if I had the ability to do X, Y, and Z? And then thinking about the structures and editing and composing reality. And I, that question that I had earlier with those engineers about why we copy reality, that's the mistake people make. Reality and realism is not your goal. It's a tool. It's a tool we use to create belief and behavior. VR is a medium, like cinema and game design. And filmmakers edit and compose their reality all their time. Jump cuts, flashbacks, close-ups, parallel edits. There is a huge edited reality that we are comfortable with and we accept as real nowadays. And that is that screen-based world, more of our reality and more real than real that we ought to tap into. And everything that you've seen here has that same sort of filmic editing of reality connection, right? I'm telling a story. I'm setting it up. And my narrative allows me to present to you anything I want. 
In fact, you can do whatever you want in these spaces if your narrative, if your story justifies it. And this is what game developers do. And games bring in that whole interested of side of interactivity, right? Games are a blend of storytelling and interaction. And they edit their stories and they edit their interactivity. I mean, look at Shigeru Miyamoto. Anybody play Mario Brothers? Donkey Kong, if you're old? I yeah. mean, a plumber rescuing a princess, fighting turtles, and having mushrooms as friends. You know, there is a, there are lessons to be learned from games, but games are also self-contained universes. Games are self-contained. They are focused. They allow and exploit failure. So they're also different because VR we don't want failure. In VR we have a, an expanding universe we need to connect with. So these ties and these these lessons that we're learning fall under the header of narrative conventions and interactive conventions. Um, there was a film scholar named Noel Carroll who wrote this uh, paper called The Power of Movies. And he's talking about the difference between a plow in the field and a plow in a movie. And a plow in a movie is very different, right? It's a prop. It doesn't have to work. It is a, you know, it's there to tell the story of maybe a farmer. Is it a new plow, a broken plow? Is there somebody hard work and sweating over it, right? That's the functionality of the plow in a film where plow in a field is a physical invention and it has to work and function. It doesn't care about your belief, right? I mean, a plow has to dig the earth. It has to be made from local materials or materials that you have on hand. It has to fit the human form, so their ergonomics. Um, if you've got animals, if you've got a tractor, it has to be able to be pulled and towed. There are physical stuff that works with a plow that are very different than our filmic plow. And that filmic stage front side of things, I mean, you see that in video games. I mean, video games, they actually call things props out of that filmic tradition. And in our VR worlds, I mean, you've almost, everyone here has had that feeling that you're on some sort of, you know, role-playing Hollywood back, back lot, some stage set as to perform. Because we haven't taken that notion of the interaction and taken it further. Um, we, we cling to reality, not just because of belief, but because we all understand it. Conventions begin by understanding. Conventions work by everyone understanding what it is. So someone who doesn't has never seen a plow before is never going to get the reference in the movie. That's the challenge that we have to work through here in VR. This is the language that we have to develop in VR. And what you've seen is the same thing as I would think 150 years ago in the earliest days of filmmaking, before jump cuts, before flashbacks, um, just somebody cutting up the world and exploring it. And guess what? I mean, in those days, people wanted color, sound, you know, frame rates that were better, film that didn't catch on fire, it's all good stuff, but cutting up good film cutting up reality that's an anathema it doesn't make sense until you understand that vr is a medium and that's the thought that i want to leave you with vr is a medium enjoy poetry and if you need help if you want to explore this genre of work um i'm i'm here to help uh <laughs> that's it for me any any questions any thoughts um any offers of, of paying work? <laughs> I'm just figuring out how to clap and get my avatar to clap, Steve. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. We, we'll all figure out, go to em, emoji, the emoji and the button and finding the emotes and clapping. Here we go. And Nick's actually dancing. That was really, really, what a masterclass. Thank you so much. I feel like we've learned more. I've learned more in 45 minutes than a long time mucking around in frame on my own. Really great. Um, uh, I guess I, I suppose I, I can I, I can just sort of start with a question, which is, I mean, it's interesting that you you see teaching as being a really good use case. Is that something that you you think VR long term is is going to be a great place for education? 
Well, well, yes. Um, you know, once once we get past putting people in desks and building classrooms that look like classrooms for silly reasons, um, you know, VR does a couple of things really well. One, it empowers me as a teacher, and I think we see the tip of the iceberg here. The other part is empowering students. And that's sort of the tricky unknown part, because how much do you want to set them loose? But if we find real structure um, and, we, and we create the conventions for classes and teaching, uh, we will do really, really well. Um, the first time in my, uh, about, God, 15 years ago, I was doing uh, user testing for this work, same sort of work with um, students from the University of Baltimore. And their, their teacher gave them two classes that they could skip. So they could skip class and come to my talk, right? Which was great. So they came and all those students who came liked what I was doing. They sat back, they enjoyed it. But I had two students say, no, I want to go to these other classes that my teacher is offering because I want to learn. Can you set up a third time for us? So I had two overachievers in their own separate group. And they didn't like the work. They wanted to be let go. They wanted empowerment. They wanted to do things on their own terms. And so for me, not giving them enough interactivity, not pushing the talk further enough for them as a developer was, was, was kind of sad. And I think that's in terms of our use cases, our, our challenge isn't going to be the students who are just show up every day. Um, we're going to have the same problems of, you know, whether it's, you know, there's a novelty to coming to VR, but that wears off relatively quickly and it just becomes another class. But it's going to be the overachieving, overachieving students who want more that I think is going to be the tricky part. Um, I think that's my answer. Is that cover you? Ever, you? You, any follow-up? Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. Um, does anyone else have questions? I haven't been checking the chat. There's a lot to take in. Um, you know, I have a body of work. Uh, what you can do now is look at it and understand what I'm doing. Yes, I so, think that's true. I, so, 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 Steve. So, yes, that's that's a really helpful. Keep on that thought. So, what? So, you've given us this master class. So, how did? So, yeah, re, rewind a bit. And so, this is a this is this where you see your teaching going in terms of helping people to? I mean, could you see your teaching going in terms of helping educators and? Uh, I mean, going down to a level of a classroom teacher and showing them a set of skills and tools so that they can then uh, bring those on to others, a bit like how, how Paul might be doing with his, his job seekers in Belgium. Well, this is what I'm actually desperate to do. Because, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful that you, 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 you get it, but it's hard to explain. And if you if I started with poetry, it'd be awkward. If I talk about changing scenes, it gets awkward. There's no context. And even in frame VR, um, you know, Gabe and the company, they're good people, they're hardworking people. But everything that you just saw is more or less a distraction for them. Um, they've made the scenes feature harder to, to use now. They spent an entire year where they took the scenes feature away from me. They accidentally broke it. Um, in the original version of the scenes feature, they had it being left on where the last person left it. So if I had if I if I had set that if I had put a clicker in and let people explore this scenes feature, if you left it here on this last slide, a new a totally new person would come in and see this last slide. And they would be totally confused about what they were seeing, and, and it, it would be sad. So, you know, I do see myself teaching. I do see myself doing more. But even at on a ground level, getting frame and gave support more directly, their interest more support more directly, is 
is needed. And but it's also not fair because this is a minority of the work. So it's going to be you exploring this genre on your own and then convincing them that, you know, AI is something cute. I mean, I don't mind AI, but there's real power that's here on the table and they can own, they can win with, I think. I think they can make money doing these types of things, but they don't, they don't get it because Again, they're engineers, they see tearing apart reality as an anathema, more or less. I mean, even if they are creative, it's still a stretch. And they've got all this other work to do. And nobody, none of their outside clients is paying for this. So, yeah, I do want to teach and do more. But it, it, And I, I am happy to help everyone here on an individual level to, to do more. And I don't mean to disframe. I mean, I really do. I, I think they're amazing people. But where they are is just, and where they're struggling is just normal. Hmm. Sorry. I've really struggled with them, trying to be nice at the same time when they keep like, mm -hmm. ah, my work is broken because they've updated. Yeah, I've had that. If, if you um, do innovate, yeah. I've, I've, uh, oh, I, can... believe, I believe um, Gabe is originally a classics teacher. Can you kind of hook mm -hmm. in on that? Uh, interesting. I can try. I mean, it's good to know. I, um, I he the poetry thing didn't seem to really resonate with him as much because I, I my, the other demo that I've done had a much more poet. I'm telling the story kind of motif, whereas this is more about design choices. Yeah. And I, I probably I, should have done the design choice version of this talk. I, um, I don't think you should have done a different talk. That was a great talk. I, I think one thing, to, <laughs> what, one thing that I've taken away as well is um, I've just, I feel like I've just had 50 minutes of an engaged online conversation, which I haven't had for a long time. So, um, you know, I've sit through, I sit, I, I am, I sit through death by PowerPoint in 2d every day of my life for sort of three or four meetings. So I'm totally enjoying this kind of this 3D immersive experience, bringing us on a tour, um, taking us, take, you know, mo moving the moving the moving the modules of the room around, reshaping reality. I, I mean, I found it very engaging. So, um, so don't I think that's for me that's the piece that's that's super exciting, and I love the fact they use the scene mechanism to change it. I think that makes perfect sense to me. I can see, I can see others doing the same, and I'm I'm definitely keen to try it the next time I kind of run a a, a different sort of session. I mean, you set the bar, oh. Steve. Here, you set the bar. Oh, thank you. Uh, that makes me very, very happy. And yeah, it's been uh, an hour. Um, you know, I don't want to keep you any longer. Steve, so can I ask if, you a question? If anyone need, yeah, sure. If anyone needs to go, um, go. But yeah, do ask questions. What, what's your take on the AI and the integration and the frame, and where you think that see that going? Um, it's, it's kind of a dead end for me because what the AI, well there's, well, there's two fronts to the AI. Let's let me frame it like that. One is a dead end, which is that you have these characters that you interact with. And, and what that does is it kind of creates a poor, a poor man's video game RPG adventure. And I think that for most people, that's probably, that's fine. But I teach game design. I use the Unreal game engine, so the, that side of things doesn't really appeal to me. It, but I think it's I think it's useful, but I don't really have an appeal. It, 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 it's not going to add the life that you want in your worlds. Have, you know, go talk to an AI character and have it tell you the same thing five times over, um, or you know, have an AI friend. I, that the whole genre just kind of weirds me out a little bit right um, but they're, maybe they're in the more, more distant future that, right they're doing they're well, doing well, ai skyboxes ai content yeah. generation you know modeling so, so it's it's interesting where they're going with it i didn't know if you were going that direction too well, that, that. well that's Pretty the other nice. side and that's yeah. that's the side that does get me interested but you just notice you saw in a classroom that doesn't exist so ai is never going to invent what i'm doing right now AI, AI isn't going to give you this talk. Right. So AI has to be led and explained 
how to build these environments that do the, these things that I want. And my so there's an amazing amount of power coming, but how do we use it? How do we wield that power? And my fear, and, and this is again, 30 years of being parent and, and, and just seeing the way things work, is that people will use the AI to build more classrooms like where we started out in, more classrooms that copy reality. Um, and that sort of design language, I, I don't know how we're going to get there. We have these thousands of novel looking worlds, and then we have people copying reality and no bridge, no understanding between them. And AI doesn't solve that problem. It helps us develop and build things, but it doesn't solve the problems that we need to really be successful in my opinion. So you can kind of see where I'm going that, yeah, it does help, but it also could be a distraction or just lead us back to more. I, I can build a hyper real castle in 15 minutes now using the right prompts. And I built it and now I'm still bored. Well, now I need AI. Well, well, my AI isn't very good. I just need AI to act the way that I think they should. So I need better AI. If your solution is more reality and more realism, you're missing you're missing the point because again reality isn't the goal reality is the tool how do we wield that tool so yes to ai but nervous about it <laughs> right i can tell <laughs> yeah. what you're saying yeah. um, again, I, i've my, been here for 30 years yes an example i saw recently <laughs> which is it's like here let the ai do it and you don't have to even interact with it let the person figure it out on their own with an ai you know, it's it's not yeah. it's not social. It's not engaging. It's sort of here throw throw some kids next to an AI and let them figure it out or something. And it seems like it's you know it takes away from the the people aspect of teaching and stuff. So, um, well, even the design aspect. I mean, what you're bringing yeah. up is that sort of like I'm making design choices about where I put things and move things and understanding the relationships between these objects and what gets unveiled in that process of building. Right. It just kills. Um, it just kills it. So yeah, now I'm even more nervous. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I just recently <laughs> saw a presentation over on the Engage platform where they were um, they created history environments that had like Ben Franklin. You go into a room and Ben Franklin's there, and you can ask him any question. Or they had Tesla, yeah. Nikola Tesla, and it was very interesting, very um, um, engaging event that where we had a whole group of people going through and touring that, and it was it was interesting how they set that up. Um, and I guess they could do that in frame too eventually when they get the uh, you know characters down and stuff. But um, well, well, that's the target. I mean, that yeah. I mean that's the big overarching goal. Yeah. Which again, instead of instead of looking at anything here, they're going to invest time in AI and follow engage, which yeah. isn't necessarily bad. But it again, wow. So yeah, I, I, it, it's it's not a bad use case, but yeah. Makes me sad. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I'm, I'm going to hey, so I, so I, 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 okay, I want to give a shout out to Alisa out yes. in the back for being quiet and coming. Uh, I know you tried to come to one of these earlier. <laughs> so kudos for making it. Thank you very much. <laughs> can, right. can, can I just, well, can I just, can I also just say before we all go, um, we'd be great to we'll try and meet again in a couple of months time so maybe sort of early early um july and if anyone would like to bring something a talk or somebody they'd like who they've heard a talk from they'd like to bring please kind of let us know because we always be great to have some somebody else to bring a different perspective a new perspective but um cool. i for all, all all remains for me is just say thank you so much steve that was a fantastic masterclass. i think we'll be buzzing and thinking about that for many many days to come and uh, look forward to continuing to connect with you over frame uh, and via the discord all right uh, i'm just gonna log out then or just leave <laughs> great cheers everyone bye for now <laughs> <laughs>